You know, it's been interesting. Uh, I do these occasional lunches with our students, and we always talk about things that are going well and things that they wish they had more of, and sometimes I hear about things they wish they had less of. Uh, but the, the, the one thing that consistently has come up, uh, especially the last couple years, is, is some more information, courses, whatever it might be, on social media and, and kind of the new wave of marketing. Uh, and it, you know, it's a very interesting topic. It, it's certainly evolving as our, our marketing faculty uh, well know. And I, there's really not even a textbook out there. And I, I think if there was a textbook, it would probably be obsolete uh, within, uh, within about six months, just given the changes. So the, the best way to take on this topic and, and provide some insights is really to go to some of the experts that are very much involved in this and, and thinking about it. So I'm glad that uh, we're able to do this. We, we hope to have more sessions like this uh, uh, to, to bring a topic like this to life. So I do want to thank uh, our alums. Uh, Dr. Bonner is going to introduce everyone here in a moment or two, but I really appreciate their taking the time because they're, they're out there in the trenches. They're the ones that are being affected by this and, and certainly the ones thinking about it. Uh, I, I'd like to just make a particular note of, uh, of our first speaker and, and, and guest here, uh, Patrick Meyer. Uh, Patrick is on my Dean's Advisory Council, and he's actually one of the very first alums that I got to know quite well uh, back in 2005 when I had arrived here. Uh, we set up a lunch in New York City, uh, and I have to tell you, it was uh, one of those kind of uh, uh, exciting, energizing discussions that you have with somewhere. By the end, I think we were kind of drawing on the, the, the tablecloth and on the walls, coming up with about a million different ideas. Uh, no credit to me, by the way. That was all Catherine. He, he's a very uh, highly engaged, very creative individual. And by the end of that conversation, I, I think the, the term ICE was coined, uh, which stands for Innovation, Creativity, Entrepreneurship, which has become a, a uh, feature of, uh, of the business school. Uh, as a former entrepreneur working uh, at that lunch with, with Patrick. It really was a, an exciting uh, a conversation, and, and he has really been a great friend uh, uh, to me personally and to the business school. So really was delighted that he could spend some time uh, talking to us today because he's very uh, very much engaged. He's been in a number of businesses along, along these lines. I want to thank uh, Patrick uh, uh, for being here uh, in particular. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn this over to uh, Dr. Bonner to make the formal present uh, introductions, and uh, thanks for being here. Okay, uh, thanks. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> Just because these gentlemen and the young lady are so accomplished, I'm going to use some notes so I don't read something off. But well, first, I'd like to thank Jim for, for really supporting this uh, executive speaker series. It's been uh, well received this year. And for that, we thank Jim. I'm going to uh, introduce our panelists in a minute. Of course, we thank them very much. I'd also like to thank Leah briefly. But Madonna Maryland, is, without her just some support, this could not have happened. She was just a tremendous help in getting everything together here. And then Mary Cozen and Victor Fars, without them, we would not have uh, anything to eat after we sat in there. <laughs> so I'd like to thank, probably, you'd like to thank them the most. Uh, okay. I had to cut down, I could talk about Patrick Meyer for an hour. His accomplishments are so vast, but I'm just going to give a few, a few really quick highlights. He's president of SourceFits Technolo Source Technologies North America. They're ranked by, I think, Ventures Best, Venture Best as the 38th leading technology company in the country. Um, before he Patrick took that role, his roles in marketing, both in line positions, he, he helped create and build and reinvent brands at Coca-Cola, uh, sort of Gillette, and Nabisco. I mean, you talk about leading companies in this country, and he helped reinvent brands for those companies. He's also served as senior consulting roles with Miller Lite, uh, Volkswagen, uh, Chrysler, and numerous other companies. So he's really had the marketing experience. Uh, in addition to that, he served, I think, what, the he was the marketing insider on the uh, radio show, uh, what was it? the advertising show. He served as the marketing insider on that show. He's also uh, a columnist in marketing thought leadership for Hub Magazine. So he's really out there at the cutting edge. He is a VSB grad. Everybody out there is a VSB grad of some sort. So he's a VSB grad. As Jim mentioned, he helped create, he actually funded the ICE Award, helped create the ICE Center. Uh, and Patrick, when you talk, I think what you're going to notice most is he is the personification of passion. And his passion is really, is really the integration of new technologies with forward-thinking marketing thought. He really brings those two things together. But I think that would be, be great just, just watching his presentation. 
Nathan is a graduate of her MBA program. And he graduated in 2000, 2008. He, he founded and became the CEO of uh, a, free, a free source agency. So he's got that going. He's, I think in his presentation, he's going to talk about some of his clients. He's been up, the business has been up for two years. He's got KM, KPMG, AARP, Starwood Capital Group, the NPD Group. Uh, he's got a whole other list that he's got to be able to show during his presentation in two years. So he's, he's basically, his company is really the world leader today in business to bit, business, to business social media support. Uh, I think that's very, very interesting. And last, but certainly not least, we brought Stephanie on the panel. She's actually uh, closer in age to all of you. She just graduated here less than two years ago, and she's director of social media for C-Rite Systems, cool. which is which is a computing and not a manufacturing <coughs> company. And she's here to uh, serve on the panel, help maybe answer some questions for someone who's, who's asking questions from your vantage point. She was sitting here, you know, these types of presentations less than two years ago, and she's now. Um, I think successfully integrated herself into the social media world. So we'll hear, uh, she's going to participate in that question and answer session afterwards. So with that, I'd like to go back and turn this over to Patrick. He's going to start. Patrick Meyer is going to give our first presentation. Nathan's going to follow the presentation. Then we'll go in Q&A, which I always worry we're going to get enough questions. But I noticed that one person coming in told me they had six or seven written down already. So, so hopefully we'll have lots of questions. OK? Patrick. I would want to kill myself if I was sitting there listening to somebody like me coming in here talking. But I want you to know I'm going a different way. I'm not talking about what we've been doing for years. I'm talking about what's going on now and tomorrow. And I'm, I'm here for one group, of per, one group of people. I'm here for you. My goal is to put an edge on what you're doing. I'm focused on innovation and I'm focused also on business 3.0. So if I don't do my job right, you're not looking at some stuff. Some new thought or saying, wow, this is great. I need to think about this for my career when I get out of school, when I'm studying it out. Um, <coughs> business 3.0 is the topic. I'm going to focus on mobile and social. I could talk about sales, retail, different strategies to build businesses at business 3.0, but I'm going to narrow it down. I'm going to start with something a little bit different. You have to bear with us. We had a little bit of a tech problem. I've got my wingman to keep with me. so. I'm going to share with you something. This is where I want to start. See if this works. Next time, you need to get a little bigger on the screen. Yeah. We can go back to the PowerPoint. Okay. The reason I showed you that video is because got there. the reason I showed you that video is that it's a viral video that was done for the Ford Fiesta. Now I see a lot of people in the audience so I had done the presentation. Just go right to this video. I want to see the full video, not the little clip that you shared. But what I'm really focused on is this car. The Ford Fiesta in 2011, it's a beacon of business to, uh, business 3.0. How many people in this room, when the bailout was going on, said to themselves, all three Detroit companies are going to have to knuckle under and take the bailout? How many thought Ford was going to take the bailout? Raise your hand. Come on, be honest. Do you think Ford was going to take it? OK, in November of that year, a bunch of guys, if you remember this, went to Washington, all the executives, right? Scandalous. They all with them private jets. They sat there getting grilled. Meanwhile, their deputies at Ford said, bring Patrick back in. He was with us for four years working on advanced car concepts in the late 90s and early 2000s. We were connecting to millennials. We were helping Ford do that, connecting to you, right? And they said, let's get him back in here with his team to do what he calls business 3.0. So at that point, we worked for three months and created a whole different marketing and business plan to turn around the Ford Motor Company. 
because they knew that they weren't taking the bail out and they didn't have the money to do big time advertising spend. At that point, we used different roles. We were doing social then. We were using cyber PR, using experiential marketing, and we were using people like yourself to endorse and embrace the brand and drive it. Now the results were, for it didn't get bad out, they quadrupled their market value at this point stock-wise, they turned around on the cars, the quality ratings have gone up. The reason I'm telling you that is that's what I want to impart to you today, is business 3.0, six principles, six drivers. Okay. Let's talk about 2.0 for a moment. What is business 2.0? I walked into a room at a company called Kohl's. They had all of their online website and digital people there. We stood up there and we showed them the hottest apps, brand new games, all kinds of stuff going on in tablets and smartphones, etc. They were excited and depressed in one meeting. They sat there and they were online guys and they realized they had just been eclipsed because they were 2.0, they're all about doing websites. By the way, browsers are 19 years old and web pages are 18 year old technology. I mean, how dated is that? But 2.0 is all what you see here. Explorer, Microsoft, kind of amazing that Apple crossed Microsoft last June on market cap. Right? So that's 2.0. 3.0 is what could go much broader than this, but honestly, it's smartphones, 3G, 4G, cloud, gaming, etc. All of this is what I call 3.0. I'm going to share with you six drivers. I'm going to bang them out real quick. I want you to know that someone here, I don't know how the is going to do it, but someone here is going to have this presentation of help. Right? On the back end, I'm going to share with you my LinkedIn, if you want to LinkedIn with me. Also my Twitter, and um, a number of other ways to get in touch with me or stay in touch. Right? Let's start with the first one. Innovation is non-negotiable. What I mean by that is, in, into your direction, in your four years, or coming out, you need to have this lens on your brain. Innovation is non-negotiable. How do I drive a business going forward with innovation? I'm telling you this because there's a, a small footwear company in the Northwest. My majority of the other people are affiliated with that footwear company. We were working on an advanced elite series shoe. We were talking about new composites that are space age. We were talking also about new ways to market it to influencers, social, etc. The president of Nike said, Patrick, we're so with you in terms of innovation. He said, I have a mantra that I share with all my people. I remind them constantly. At Nike, innovation is non-negotiable. That's the first one I want you to take away. The reason I'm saying that's important because innovation drives business growth. Innovation, if let's say you're an accountant and you have an innovation straight in you, or you're a marketing person or a finance person, if you've got innovation and creativity as an edge, you stand out from the person sitting next to you. If I went to Wharton right now, there would be three people sitting here. I guarantee one wouldn't have a clue about innovation and creativity. This one might talk a good game, and maybe this person is doing something big. What's different here is innovation, creativity, and entrepreneurship at the level. So this award that you see right here is simply a beacon of innovation and creativity being important here. It drives business growth. It gives you an edge. I know that CEOs are looking for it in people. When Jim and I sat down five years ago and we talked about it, I was connecting to millennials, I was reinventing Miller Lite and, and Coors and doing something else in, uh, innovation wise. I sat down with them, I started ranting, right? I said, the world doesn't need more students coming out with a tech background. I'm sorry, not tax background. They need to come out, they need to be pragmatic and passionate, and they have to think the right way, and they also need to be innovative. So the first one is innovation. Make sure that you're building it in your background. Okay. Now, you may recognize this. This is the, ta the daily tablet by, I'm sorry, on the iPad by Murdoch. It's the daily. And this was their premier issue. I thought it was kind of interesting. This is what ICE is all about. It's about climbing to a new level. It's about finding new things and seeking new things. So I want you to come with me and climb. Let me share with you a video. Keith, you ready, man?
and they did intercepts one on one where they're just in 30, 60 seconds clicking and showing quick pieces up front. Now, think about the implications of moving your sales force to an iPad. Well, that's what happened. So, after they had the most successful sales seller they ever had, they came back and said, Patrick, can you guys take our entire sales bag, our sales stuff, and move it to the iPad? And that's what we're doing. And that's what's going on in business everywhere. So, if you're in finance, if you're in accounting or wherever, you need to be thinking about enterprise solutions that you'll be building as part of what you do. And that's productivity, that's communication in many different areas. Really important place is the enterprise app. Blown wide open, um, Steve Jobs was talking about the enterprise consumer, meaning C-suite executives walking in now empowered because they've got phones and they think they know about tech. And it's completely great to have uh, in a good way. The next thing is mobile, well, that time. 3G and 4G, when it comes, means 4G is three to six times faster than what you currently have in 3G. The implications of 4G is that video is going to be streaming in so quick, there's no upload on that way, it's just coming right in. So every form of video will become more important than what you do. So, for example, I'm going to show a book right now, and then I'm going to vlog. I'm not vlogging. That's almost it's important right now, but I'm focused on after TV or something like that. So the idea of doing a quick hit video that's released live and broadcast to people on their mobile phones. So the second or the third thing here is mobile to mobile video. I want to share with you a quick video of what's called what's that here? It's called Knocking Live. And probably some of you have it on your phone. This is a company that I was on the board of and helped develop this. And then it was actually being developed by SourceBits. So where are you? I'm Brian. The co-founders of Knocking Live Video. And you're the guy who uh, got Apple to really change its stance to on video apps for the uh, iPhone and iPad, right? Yeah, actually wrote uh, a letter to uh, Steve Jobs on a Saturday morning, early morning, and then on uh, Monday morning received a call from Apple Upper Management. And the first question I asked was, is this in regards to the email I sent on Saturday? And that email was about everybody, not just our application, but improving, you know, our knocking live video application for for us, but also improving all the other video applications that then came out after that. So it was great to hear that they're listening. And, and what is it that you guys do? And, and so we what share, are we seeing here? So this is actually on my iPad, but we share live video phone to phone. So that actually just ended there. So that's your wife. That was, that was your wife. wife. Now here's 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 my here's my partner Jim Montalto. He's out message. front here. Yep. So it sends a knock. We call it knock. It's a push notification. You just tap open and then boom, live video. This is actually live video here at TechCrunch Disrupt, right out front, where we're displaying knocking live video. Jim's showing a little sneak peek of we're coming with knocking one to many. We're going to be able to send a knock to hundreds of friends, if not hundreds of thousands of friends, that may be following your live video. Great. Thank you. Thank you. We go back to the other screen. Okay. The implication for you is not just what you do business-wise, but think about your resume. When you're putting together your bio and you're sending out a resume, if I don't think about it, send paper, my God, a video of you come to life, right? Think of all the things that you can be doing with 3.0 rules, not just business.
but we did it with social. Cyber PR and the app was designed to be social because as soon as you open it, immediately it's easy for you to go, oh, I'm going to write my friends. So you want to write 50, and they write 50, and they write another 50. And it just spiraled out of control in a great way. So what I want you to think about is mobile and social fusion. So not only breaks mobile, but if you think about how you work together. Now, I'm not going to leave it just there. Here's the other piece. Now, our company, we're the leaders in mobile and social gaming, mobile social gaming apps and solutions. So we do some amazing games. This happens to be one called Beast Farm. If you haven't played it, you might want to get it. It's great. So that's three games on the iPhone. The reason I'm showing you this is that inside of games, how many people here play, play mobile games? <coughs> Many games. Yeah, everybody, right? So if you know that when you've got a great game, there are little tiny elements, little part of the interface, the UI, little things that are in it, right? Well, those game elements are so important inside of apps inside of digital. And what's happening is because you're playing with those, let's say, buttons and dials and the things that spin, right? You want that in other things. So smart markers are like, not only will use social with my mobile, but I'll bring in gaming elements. Okay? So here's an example. Has anybody seen Urban Dad? There's a restaurant hook app, spray app. But it has a button called the Hyper Button. When you hit this button, Spins. And all of a sudden, it brings up the coolest places in Miami, London, New York, whatever. Right? It's like gaming brought into something on fine restaurants. Right? Over here on the right, how boring are charts and stuff normally in corporate presentations? Romby finds a way to create animated, beautiful, almost like Apple did it, graphics. So the one in the middle, you can't see this, it's like cover flow. With Apple, you can flip through it, it's bonded, it looks great. One on the right charts for a lot. If you're in finance and if you're in accounting, you're going to be more, you're going to want to be using this kind of stuff to bring to life for your management, whoever you're working with. So gaining elements, but it's also going into other parts of business. Not just you're you doing a presentation, you're doing advertising. You better be thinking about how to bring in gaining elements, if that's what you expect as consumers. Okay, next one, we're almost done. Next theme is GL data and geo advantage. What I mean by this is that the beauty of a smartphone is that this device moves with you. This device lets you engage and activate wherever you are. That's what doesn't work online. This company right here is called ESRI. They're the biggest mapping company, bigger than Google, Google Map, or they're not. This one app that's in front of you, let me, let me describe what this is like. Let's say you're a a real estate manager for Walmart. You walk in with your customer or somebody next to you, you stand in front of the building. You take your iPad like this. You hit a big button, big fun button in front. We designed it this way. Gaming off right there. You hit the button, and all around you, what comes down is all this data and fun stuff, like the room stuff, that shows you that location, that store, what it's sold for, how it compares to your criteria. It shows you the makeup of the neighborhood. It shows you diversity, it shows you unemployment, etc. All right there. <coughs> you can then compare that to another city, another one. You can print out a report, so all of that's sitting on that app. Okay. The reason I'm sharing this with you is geodata is the next thing. The ability to take that Hershey's app, as an example, walk in to see Walmart, you know, like this, hit a button, and bring down all this data in real time of all stores around the country or the latest market share, or latest social, or crowdsourcing, you know that app. So next theme that's really important is geodata. You guys still with me here? I know it's late, you're waiting, you're gonna get out of here. Um, next one is called taking the geodata piece, location-based services. How many people here have Foursquare, Koala, maybe one of the most location-based apps? Well, not some guys have Foursquare here. It's already okay. So the idea here is how do you take the location <coughs> aspect of GL and use it to drive your business? I call it E, engagement and activation technology. You need to understand this because most marketers haven't figured this out, most companies haven't, that this is the ability to get people to buy. Wherever you're standing, walking into a mall, and all of a sudden it sees that you buy Starbucks all the time, and you're walking in and it goes, Starbucks. I won't get them free. Right? 
That kind of technology is coming fast and furious. The reason it's coming so quick is that the carriers and the credit card companies and the banks are all trying to figure out a way to link it to your phone. So let's come over here to the left. We were with Playboy people recently. So if you were, I know you guys would read Playboy for the content, right? For the yeah. article. But if you were going through and you came to an article or a Playboy, and you, you took a snapshot of that money, immediately what comes up on your phone is an interview of her talking about the making of that article or the magazine. So first one is QR codes, right? The second one is, is engagement activation through shopping. Okay. This is the ability to walk into a Best Buy and all of a sudden it's giving you off. The one on the right was introduced <coughs> by Eric Schmidt of Google last November called NFCs. Near field communication. The ability to go like this and touch a touch an hand, an outdoor board, walk into the store, touching stuff, and all of a sudden it's giving you offers or you're buying stuff. That's what's coming. Apple's running right behind them. They'll be there probably at the Worldwide Wealth Conference in Jack and June with the same thing. So <coughs> that's important. I'm going to float this in because one of the professors will say, what about metrics? What about metrics? How important they are? I'm just telling you, everything that's out here has to have metrics. And I'm not talking stock metrics. I'm talking about linking it back to purchase or wherever your objectives are. So these metrics and all the stuff. This is the last one. Maybe I'm almost done, but yeah, this next one, you may like Charlie Sheehan, you may hate Charlie Sheehan, but there's an interesting thing that happens with Charlie Sheehan. This is a snapshot of Charlie Sheehan's Google image page. And if you look at that, look at all the episodes of Charlie. His tour that's on his third or fourth location. Uh, I don't know who that is on the end. And he's moving, drunk or whatever, at the upper, you know, upper right. This is episodic. Either there, he's brilliant, or he, he, that fault, he's got episodic going on. Episodic is something I want you to think about. I've done this for 20 years. I've turned on more brands, more businesses. The way we did it before was with episodic. And the concept is this. Create episodes of your brand or your business that are four or five weeks you know, long that are all about punching through. Now, you're going to use social and start with PR and traditional TV, whatever. But it's the idea of creating big episodes. Right? I'm telling you this for the business reasons and also for your career. Is what you want to do is when you come out of the logo, you want to create an episodic career direction. Right? So let's, this is knocking. We launched it with first a picture sharing app, then an iPhone app, then an Android app, then an iPhone and Android app that we came with the public space on. And now we're going to set to come with something else next month. From a career standpoint, you would do the same thing. You would come out of school, work for a company, maybe you're working on your MBA at night, or do a certain seminar, you have a certain wing, you come out with a brand new app, CEO loves you, you know, all the way along. But you're creating a story of episodes in your career. I'm telling you that, someone recently said to me, every time you speak in our group, you talk about what we did career wise, how did you do that? I said, it was a story. I created the story about me over time of achievements in the ways and interesting things. So episodic for business and episodic for you. Now I said that knocking is coming next month. Just every one of the business 3.0 that I've been talking about are in the launch of something we're coming with next month. It's called knocking to many and we have something coming with celebrities. I can't tell you about it, but you want to check back because you're already hearing about the top 10 celebrities using this to talk to millions of people and broadcasting live. But let's come back to you. To me, what I wanted to do here was to share things that are important that you could use to A, become an innovator, account, marketing, finance person, and also an innovator. The next is to point out the importance of mobile and social. So when you're interviewing with a company, they go, wow, you did a project in, on mobile, or you took that apps class, or you know, you're doing it on the side with a bunch of people. That kind of A is what you need when you're coming out of a mobile. And lastly, is to think about your career and creating a story or a set of episodes. On the bottom here is my LinkedIn, my Twitter, and website. If I can help you, or if you want to really stay in touch or whatever, or follow me on Twitter, I guarantee it would be some interesting stuff that you read. Okay?
I also have a book that's coming. It's not when I'm here. I just have to have a book that's coming in a couple months. Um, so keep an eye out for that. It's on a mobile social game and app, and it's fantastic. <coughs> I decided to make this book it's so much fun because think about it. Apps are really fun. They're powerful. They're fun. They're fun. They're quick and easy. So it's a hundred page book. It's not black and white. It's all pictures and interesting stuff. And it's scandals in the middle where I talk about the Clash of the Titans. I tell you what goes on in the boardrooms between Apple and Google and Verizon and AT, AT, et etc. The last piece, now is your time to plan the hill. And if you're saying, well, I'm not sure if I can do that. I'm just going to share with you. This is a picture of me when I was back in college. How many people know about the Dan Lola Real Estate School? Everybody knows about the Real Estate School, right? Where are you? Dan is down there. See, it's the ice the isolator next to him because he's really bold. Thank her. My best friend and the two of us are always stepping out and I'm in the middle of above. But the two of us, and no one we're just a bunch of guys drinking beer and we believe that we do some big things. My point is, take this kind of bold thinking, add into what you've already got going on, and you can do some amazing things. Thank you. So, uh, so awesome. Thank you guys, uh, and thank you, Patrick, for that. Um, I, uh, I, I'll tell you a little bit. I was a terrible student, but I uh, really enjoyed that. Uh, and I had sort of a, you know, I love to learn about this stuff. So, so thank you for coming today. It's an incredible honor to, to be presenting to you all. Um, it, you know, uh, Villanova is very special to me on, on, on so many different levels. Um, really transformed my life, um, which I, uh, at the time when I enrolled in the EMBA program, uh, the, the, the promise, the brand was you know, transformation and I just didn't believe it and it has completely transformed my life. So I, I really am uh, indebted to the program and to the DECO and all the teachers that put up with me you know, here. Um, so, uh, you know, in terms of what I was looking to accomplish today, uh, I have a little bit of a framework, it's pretty simple. Uh, I don't have a lot of time, but I do want to share my, my story very quickly. Uh, and the reason I do that is, is really because I think it's, it represents what, what you all can do with social media. Um, social media is uh, really, you know, the, the opportunity there is incredible. And I think if you want to, if, if I will go as far as to call it a success story, uh, I think there's, there's some elements in there that you can take with you. Um, talk about social media as an opportunity, so that's why we're all here today, is really to understand social media. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly about LinkedIn. Uh, and then I'm going to roll into uh, about five minutes of a, a presentation I do a lot called You 2.0, which is the idea of taking you to the next level, you know, the second iteration of you, Dean Danko 2.0 kind of thing. Um, so, uh, but it's really, it's really bringing you onto the web, you know, putting your, putting your real world presence onto the web. And that, that's an incredible opportunity if leveraged correctly. It's also a total liability if you don't understand what you're doing. Uh, you can really do a lot of damage. So um, just a quick little uh, story about myself. Um, first, uh, I'll start off with my picture. People wonder why I put my picture in my live presentations. Uh, it's sort of a proactive thing. You know, I, I'm socializing the document. I know that it might get, uh, you know, go around the web. So uh, I'm a people person, even on the web. So I like to, to kind of create that, uh, that, uh, that touch. So uh, real quick, my story. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of FreeSource. Uh, you've probably never heard of us. Um, but uh, we are a B2B social media consulting firm. Uh, I was, used to work for LinkedIn. Um, how many people in here actually know what LinkedIn is? OK. So like a year ago, like, even in the college crowds, like a lot of people still didn't even know what it was. Uh, but I was an early LinkedIn sales manager. Uh, talking about Villanova you know, changing and transforming my career. It helped me get that position at LinkedIn. I was a lowly chemical sales guy uh, before Villanova. So, um, you know, Villanova really helped get me into the high tech space. So, um, got a job with LinkedIn. It's an amazing experience. Uh, I was selling their human resources and recruiting solutions. And, um, you know, I was the crazy enough guy to leave LinkedIn because I saw a gap in the market. I saw an opportunity to educate corporations on how to use all these free technologies not just sell my LinkedIn upgraded solutions, which were $30,000, $35,000 a pop. People just didn't, they didn't have budget, the economy was crashing, you know, they were laying people off, not hiring, and I'm selling hiring solutions. So, um, so I was at LinkedIn. Uh, I have a hospitality background, so I've always been in sort of service side of business, relationship management, et cetera. 
Um, serial entrepreneur, probably written 50, 55 business plans, all to very different lengths. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, this business here has no business plan still. Um, but uh, we're working on that because we're, we're now dealing with investors and they want to see something on paper. Uh, but uh, you know, the business just launched. They just started billing people. And um, I called in my brother-in-law who'd been left off, uh, or laid off. And uh, I was like, dude, I, I gotta start like, invoicing and stuff. I have no idea what to do. <laughs> um, so he was like, you know, send, send all your receipts and everything my way. And, uh, so it's been great. Um, I went to the hotel school up at Cornell as Villanova School of Business 08. Um, for anyone in the room that uh, is looking at me funny or just knows me, uh, I have about every disease that you could uh, mentally have, o OCD, ADD, you name it. I actually made this one up. I call it OCG. Um, I'm an obsessive compulsive geek and there's no doubt about it. If you know me, I'm definitely a dork. Um, but I love it, and I think I think being a geek is is all about being passionate. You know, it has a lot to do with you know, geekiness. People think of technology, but I think if you're you, you can be a geek for nursing or the nursing school. You can be a geek for a lot of things. So I just associate that with being passionate. Uh, and then finally, just as I reiterated earlier, I was a terrible student, always a hard worker, but a great networker. And the reason I say that is because uh, a I've networked my way into just about everything, and I've networked my way out of just about everything. But technology, and what I'm talking about today, enables networking. Um, so if business is, is, is about networking, if you talk to a lot of C-level people, they'll say, I got here through networking. Um, you know, this technology that we're talking about today enables that. Um, and by the way, I'm not endorsing being a bad student. I think if that was the one thing that I could go back and fix, uh, it, it really set me back, actually. So I, I think I'd be even farther along if I was a better student. Ultimately, what I did is I burned a lot of relationships being a bad student, um, so I had to go back and fix them. Uh, my mantra, I love new technologies and I love helping people. That follows me around everywhere. It's on my LinkedIn profile. It's every presentation I do. I, I live and I breathe it. It's, it's really true. Um, in terms of my business, just real quick, um, in February 2009, I left LinkedIn and it was Nathan and his laptop, literally. Um, everybody thought I was crazy. It was crazy Nathan and his laptop. I am crazy, by the way. And um, I, I left LinkedIn because I just saw this market opportunity. I had a MacBook, and um, I, I, I started my business. Um, you know, two years later, in terms of progression, I went from my basement, uh, which is disgusting. I tried to take a picture and put it in here last night, but I just, it didn't really fit the format. But it's just a terrible, unfinished basement. I finished my garage. I spent six grand on that <clears throat> to, uh, to, to hire my first employee and to have a place for them to work. Uh, then we moved to Wilmington in a flex office, uh, enjoyed that, and then ultimately moved to Philly. Today we're downtown Philly and Liberty One. Um, so uh, it's, been a, it's been a wild two years in terms of just uh, the growth on that side of the business. Uh, today we have full, three full-time employees, 15 contractors. Um, our, our core competency, I couldn't really get into definitions today, but our core competency is B2B social media. So as, as Patrick started to touch in on, on the end, you know, the, the enterprise applications, that's really what we, we focus on in, 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 in using social media for, for large corporations, but not on the consumer side. So internally, how are employees using it? Um, that's, that's where we go to work. So there's really strategy development, training and consulting, and enterprise application development are, are sort of our, our, our core business. Uh, we are, I call ourselves a boutique firm. I got that from Steve Andrioli. Uh, he's like my favorite teacher, but I hated his guts when I first met him. But um, he's, uh, he's on my advisory board and, and, is, and is very significant in, in, in getting me here to where I am today. But he always said, call yourself boutique. Um, and, uh, but we serve a global client base. Um, some of these brands you've heard of, some of them you haven't. Uh, Crystal Brands, you know, big four auditing firms, uh, credit reporting companies, AARP. Some people in the room know who that is, some people don't. I didn't, I, di I had no idea who they were. They called me and they were like, we saw you speak and uh, we'd like you to come down to DC. And I'm like, okay, whatever. And I got home and I looked back at the email. I'm like, what is ARP? <laughs> I, I looked it on Google and I was like, oh, okay. This sounds like a good gig. Um, <laughs> so, um, so it's been really fun. I put this up here for a couple of reasons. One is sort of like validation. A lot of people say they're social media marketing consultants or trainers or whatever, and they're really not. They just got laid off a couple years ago. Um, and they're, they're um, you know, they're just, they're just marketers. So part of it's validation. Um, 
you know, we all came from LinkedIn, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but the other thing is we don't have a sales force, right? Um, so I, I'm the, the sales guy for the company and I, we drink our own Kool-Aid. I mean, every single one of these brands, and there's a lot more, I just couldn't fit it on here. I have a different presentation for that, for what I'm selling. Um, but every single one of them has a LinkedIn story to it. Social media somehow helped me acquire that deal. Uh, and I do it by leveraging my relationships. So I see who people know, and I work the network to get to where I want to get. So I used to do that old school, like back in the day, uh, and now I've got technology to back it up, and because I used to work for LinkedIn, I understand it just about better than anybody else. So I, I, I bring that to market. That's what we teach our clients, is how to do business development, sales, marketing, research, talent acquisition, you name it, knowledge management, resource management. There's an application for, and I don't mean an app like, like Patrick's app, I mean there's literally a way to use these technologies for all of this. So uh, that's sort of the, the company in a nutshell. Um, I, I just put this slide in here. Um, I, I made some assumptions about the audience. I usually don't do that, but I usually do definitions. We just didn't have time. But in terms of social media, I, I just the baseline thing I want to say is like I'm actually lumping in Web 2.0 and social media together as we talk about these things. So um, because Patrick referenced you know, Business 3.0 and whatnot, um, I just to be clear, Web 2.0 to me is the web as a service. So that's online banking, that's Yelp. I mean, it's this whole space, and you know, Yelp is sort of lands in the middle with social media. But it, it, when I talk about social media for the rest of the conversation, I'm lumping in Web 2.0. If we had more time, we'd, we'd maybe delineate. Um, but social media has changed everything, literally everything. And I don't mean like some weird portals opened up and like you know you can time travel quite yet. But I literally mean like everything in our lives has been changed by social media. And Facebook and MySpace and some of the early companies led the social charge in terms of changing our social lives. Um, but other businesses are out there you know, set on changing just about everything else because the capabilities are there. Patrick's got some great examples that I didn't even really think about. But everything has changed. Uh, every process, you know, it doesn't matter what it is. I challenge you to find something that social media has not impacted in some way and where there will not continue to be innovation. Um, so your personal world, your professional world, your academic world, for any of the teachers in here, like this is not something you can just sit by and watch and teach your students about and get some guest speakers to come in. Your world is changing. So it, social media is impacting how people learn. It's, people, it's, it's impacting how people get education. Uh, and it's really exciting in a lot of levels, but a lot of institutions are sitting back and just like they're scared because they, just, they don't know how to deal with it. And you know, they, they're, they're historic, they've been this way for so many years, how could anything threaten that? But um, it, it really, is, it's an incredible opportunity, as I'll talk about in a second, but there's, there's nothing that social media and Web 2.0 has not impacted. There's no part of our lives untouched. Uh, and ultimately, it just comes down to the fact that social media is just another communication channel. And I'll make the argument that life is just communication. So everything we do, every part of this experience right now, and everything you've ever done in your life, and business as well, is just communication. It's just talking, it's, it's people making promises, it's relationships. None of that happens without communication. So social media is just like steroids on communication. Everything changes, and it's an incredible opportunity for you all. But I want to talk about three quick trends, um, and I'll, the, the third will dovetail the rest of the presentation. The first is convergence. So I don't just mean technology converting with other conversion, conver converting with other technologies, you know, like Facebook and Twitter get together and start a joint venture, or there's all these applications over here that Patrick's talking about, or they're merging things that used to happen. I'm talking about convergence with our lives. I actually believe in the singularity movement where man becomes machine, right? So it's already happening today. We have technology embedded in people all the time. Uh, that's going to keep happening. And as you look out on the landscape, as you graduate and, and, and move out into your careers, convergence is a, is, a, is a scary thing, but it's also an incredible opportunity. So the second trend is disruption. And that word may be overused, maybe it doesn't get into this space as much, but disrupting and disruption is, is a big buzzword out in the space. Uh, but I put this in here, and I'll talk about LinkedIn in a few minutes, but there are companies laser focused on disruption. They've got millions and millions and millions of dollars backed by you know, venture capital firms literally to disrupt processes. So if you can imagine that, and then you can imagine a little, you know, like the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world that can, can disrupt everything from their college dorm room, there's real opportunity there, and that's really the third trend. 
is that you need to be able to, to spot these things. This is an incredible opportunity for you guys out there to say, you know, I don't want to just go be part of a corporate machine. You know, look for opportunity. Look for things where, where nobody has potentially done anything. You, you could potentially be on the bleeding edge and, and create net new things. And, and that's what we're doing. But, you know, I really want to emphasize what an incredible opportunity this is for all of you. Uh, not to scare you. Maybe the, the deans and the professors are in. You should be scared. But the students should look at this as an opportunity. Um, so in terms of opportunity, um, there's sort of two things that I was always taught. Uh, and you know, this is how success, this is how you'll be successful in business, right? Um, it's not about what you know, it's rather who you know, right? Is that right there, right? Yeah. So does it, do people agree with this? Has anybody been taught this? Seriously, I mean, just I know you guys are like, is there anybody who believes this? Somebody, you, you look smart. Sure. He believes it. Okay, so, and then secondly, business is about being in the right place at the right time, okay? So if you can just like, if you're not raising your hand and you agree with me, or if you just take a leap of faith, I've been taught these things for a long time. So if those things are too, true, if you can hold true there, um, you know, those things are actually pretty hard to pull off. It's hard to be in the right place at the right time. You know, you've literally got to be Eduardo Savardo, whatever his name is, in Mark Zuckerberg's class at the right time, at the right place to be a part of Facebook. Um, and you know, lightning strikes kind of thing. It's, it is hard to be in the right place at the right time. And I, I'll say that's hard. I've had a hard time doing that. But you know, social media strikes again. I mean, it, it, you can be everywhere. You you can see people that you need to know. So the old boy network where like it's just like all like closed off and you don't have access. You now have access and, and insight where you never had it before. So if you guys are looking out, how do I get this job with this company? You don't just submit your resume to the Oracle like black hole portal anymore and just like pray that something comes back. You can go on LinkedIn and see who the hiring manager is. You can see how you're connected to them. You can send them a message. Like that, that is totally not the case, you know, just a couple years ago. So it's really easy to actually be in the right place in the right time and the opportunity now is to create the context to be the person that is selected or to, to, to be the innovator. Uh, and that's really where I'll, I'll, I'll shift the rest of the presentation. But I do want to talk about LinkedIn real quick. Um, you know, everybody kind of knows LinkedIn and maybe some people are on it. Um, I, I usually do a, a little bit longer presentation where I reset what everybody thinks about LinkedIn. But just generally speaking, some fresh numbers. 105 million members uh, today, 3 million new members per month. It's a million, or it's a, it's a, it's a new, new member every second. Um, so a lot of people here is the professional networking site. Uh, people make the argument that you know, Twitter combined with it, there's some junk in there now. But that, that mirrors the, the real world to me. You know, business isn't always business. You know, we talk about our families and stuff. Um, so, but it is the professional networking site. The distinction I want to draw is that it, I, I do not consider it a social network. Right? So social to me, even though the technology is called social, you're going on to waste time. When people go on to LinkedIn, they're going there to do business. Right? I gotta find something, I gotta get a piece of information, I gotta do something. Um, so it really is, it, it's about business, but I like to think of it as software. And when you talk to executives about it being software, they all say, oh, okay, I've been using software for a long time. You're right, that is valuable. Um, where a lot of times if you don't make that distinction, they're like, isn't social media something my kids do? And I track them on social media. Um, so if you look at it as software, it just changes the distinction a little bit. And I used to say this when I worked for LinkedIn. I believe it more now today. I used to have a bullet in there, but I didn't have time. Uh, LinkedIn is the most powerful software ever. Literally. I, I challenge anyone in this room, even Patrick, to find a technology that is more powerful than LinkedIn. And the reason I can say that is because all that other technology you have is like stale and static for the most part, right? LinkedIn is SaaS, right? So it's software as a service. It updates every week. They've got more engineers working on making LinkedIn more powerful and more powerful every week. And you don't get an email that says, by the way, like they fixed these widgets and added all these cool things that changed the game for your type of business. But Every single week at you know, Friday at 3 a.m. Eastern Time, they release you know, R1879, and all the engineers like cheer. And you know, a whole new product series is, is released. So if you think you know LinkedIn today, in six months, if you haven't gotten a tutorial or somebody hasn't showed you some new stuff, you're six months dated. 
And you know, there's no other software out there like that. Um, and LinkedIn is laser focused on disrupting business. Is that I'll talk about that? <coughs> But everyone uses LinkedIn differently. That's another sort of hurdle that I try and help people get over. Sorry, I keep turning my back to the people over here. Um, the, the way a CEO uses it is very different than an author, very different than a consultant, very different than a recruiter, very different than a student, very different than a, than a teacher. Uh, many times people are taught blanket scenarios, but it doesn't really work out for them. So once they learn how to use the tool, you just sort of understand that the rest of the world doesn't use it the way you do, right? And that's the same thing in our real world. I mean, you have to have an awareness. You have to understand how to approach somebody. You have to understand how people are using these, these tools. So you kind of have a social awareness. I, I mentioned LinkedIn being laser focused on disrupting business. Uh, I mean, that, that just for anybody that's in business, like this, this is, is, an, is, a, is, a, is a pretty scary thing, but all at the same time, it represents a lot of opportunity. Uh, but the thing that I want to really uh, encourage all of you to, to consider is, is using LinkedIn as the beacon for your online brand. You don't want your Facebook and sometimes your Twitter and sometimes just your like digital residue to be the things that people find when they're looking for you. You want to lead with your, 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 your most professional you know, look. And LinkedIn can be that for you. It also has incredibly high accreditation in search engines. So if somebody's looking for someone like you or specifically for you, they type in your name. Um, LinkedIn comes up very high in search results, so it's a great way to, to, to present yourself online. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, Communications 101 and your resume, like your resume class used to be like my favorite class in college, it was also like the easiest, but um, it, it was really important to me to have a good resume and the cardstock had to be perfect and I was really anal about it. Um, I can't tell you how important your, your LinkedIn profile and your online presence is in, in terms of what people see. Because you don't have the opportunity a lot to give them context. Oh, I, I didn't, you know, haha, ha, like I didn't mean to mis misspell management. I mean, they just look at it and go, misspell management, out of the job for it. I had a conversation the other day with a CEO of a company, this is totally unfair by the way. He said, I didn't hire that guy because he didn't have enough LinkedIn connections. And I was like, are you kidding me? I mean, like, he, yeah, he's like, oh yeah, they only had 100. I'm like, what if those are 100 best connections you could ever have? And he's like, yeah, oh, that's a good point. <laughs> but, I mean, people are making these kind of judgments. I mean, it, 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 it may be obtusely unfair, but people are judging you by your online presence. Uh, so I, I would spend a lot of time on it. I actually, I mean, I think my website sucks, and I don't care. I mean, I'm not going to spend any time and invest anything in it right now. I spend more time on my LinkedIn profile and my network than I do on, on my company website. So just think about that and think about the way the rest of the world is using it. I mean, I talked about everybody using it differently. I mean, people, corporations are using it to recruit. They're looking at you, right? Um, so you either don't show up because you don't have a LinkedIn profile or you show up poorly, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, oh, here we go. So uh, on the left-hand side, this is a, I'm a visual guy, if you can't tell me. Um, this is a visual representation of a sub-optimized presence online. So, you know, especially for the people wearing suits in the room and, and all of you that I know if you were going on a job interview, you'd actually dress, you know, uh, you know appropriately. Um, I call that designing how you show up. So you design how you show up in the real world. Um, you, you spend a lot of time and money invested in designing how you show up. You answer the phone a certain way. You do things a certain way because you design it. But that, that professional real world presence does not translate <coughs> online. It's actually, it doesn't really happen at all. You have to put a little bit into it. But generally speaking, I put money on the fact that most people in the room show up like this. Barely. You know? Or it's like schizophrenic. There's like eight of you. Which one are you? So the, the reality is, though, is that I look at social media as the great equalizer. So you can't hide anything anymore. Because I can see. Anyone can see. So you can't be one person in the real world and be a different person online. And, you know, a lot of professors have learned that hard way. You know, like, they used to have the classroom that they could be a total jerk in the classroom and, and like, like abuse students. And if they ever observed ever complaint, they'd just be like, I didn't do that. And they'd be tenured and people would have to listen. But today, it's like, well, not only do we have documentation that we did this, but it's all over the web. I mean, you know, the student videotaped doing it in the room. You're fine. So, <laughs> It is, it's a pretty incredible uh, game-changing technology, but the idea here in terms of, I'm not trying to admit, I'm not trying to make people feel bad that they show up online, just nobody taught you, right? Um, 
But in terms of the opportunity, you want to show up online powerfully. You want to show up 24 seven. You want to have all your relationships and the context and the case studies and the recommendations. And some people are like, recommendations are crap. And they're not crap. Recommendations from like your, your spouse or your, your, your uh, subordinates are crap. I mean, that's digital brown nosing and people see right through it. But you know, recommendations from your professors and, and, your, and your clients are very powerful and go a long way. Because when I'm stuck in this room, like you guys in a meeting, or if I'm presenting, but, uh, or if I'm sleeping at night, my LinkedIn profile is out selling on my behalf in like all over the world. People are checking me out, they're saying, who's this guy? And they look at my profile and they see who I'm connected to and they're like, oh my God, you know, this looks legit. So I don't, I'm, I've got like, my, this is my sales force. But the opportunity is here for all of you, right? Especially at the, the enterprise level. I mean, if you've got a fleet of a thousand sales reps, they're, on, they're finite. They've got 40 hours in any given week, maybe 50. But they can only be in one place at one time. So if you think about optimizing that entire sales force, you've got a thousand online profiles with hard code web links, we can provide SEO, uh, advertising, I mean you can install all kinds of stuff on their profiles. So it's a really, really powerful, powerful opportunity and something I want to present to you guys is just, you know, as you're looking for your X factor and you're looking to differentiate and you know, it's a tough job market out there, your online presence is going to be the differentiator. Um, just a quick, I mean, I can't go to the web, but this is a gentleman named Joe, Min Joe Meisner who uh, works for Experian, early client of ours. Um, total, total badass. Um, been, been doing this, you know, selling software like this for like 30 years. Hated LinkedIn, hates Facebook, hates them all. By the way, I hate Facebook. Um, but hated LinkedIn and, and, and actually tried to delete his account a couple times. And, and we asked for him specifically in part of our case study. And, um, and this is like the after, right? So this is the optimized Joe Meisner. Uh, he's one of our biggest fans today. He's like, I can't believe I was ever selling without LinkedIn. This is like the most amazing thing in the world. Um, and it's not about having, you know, a, you know, a, a three mile long profile with, you know, a ton of, you know, 8,000 connections. Um, you know, Joe only connects to people he knows and trusts, 151 connections. But that's his power network. Those are his clients over the last 35 years. So if you're like, get into Joe's network, you're in like his little private no network. So there's a, there's a lot, I hate this, um, there's a lot uh, uh, here, but this, and this is not right, it's just an example, but this is the optimized Joe Meisner, this is like him being a badass in the real world, now being a badass online. So, you know, there's a lot of examples out there, and there's a lot of classes and stuff like that on, on LinkedIn, but they generally are telling you, like, connect to everybody, and, you know, you know tweet five times a day, and you know, do all these things. They're prescribing things to you that are probably not aligned with what your actual business objectives are. So you got to align this stuff to what's important to you. If you don't, it, it becomes more of a liability. But uh, just sort of a little case study there, and then in closing, in my humble opinion, uh, LinkedIn and your holistic online presence is going to be the thing that, that changes the game for you. It's going to be your X factor. It's the only way you're going to be able to differentiate yourself from the rest of the resumes out there. Most of the corporations that we're working with today, just from a trend perspective, the resume is just a formality. They don't care at all. They're not reading it. They're looking at your LinkedIn profile. They're checking you out on Facebook. Is this guy going to be a liability or an asset or gal? Somebody said that to me earlier, like gal. Oh, there it was. Yeah. Uh, it, so, so you really need to, to understand that you know, the things that you do tonight could impact whether or not you get the job in a couple months. Um, so controlling that's very, very hard. Um, in fact, it might be one of the most challenging things to do, um, but that's a whole other conversation. So three steps, and then I'm done. Um, optimize your profile, right? So I talked about LinkedIn, but optimize your online presence. Make it work for you, right? It doesn't mean fill out the, all the fields. Uh, many people's optimized profile is not completely filled out. It just works for them. Optimize your network, right? So for the people in here that are connected to 5,000 people they don't know, optimizing your network means cutting the fat, right? Get rid of all the people you don't know. It's hurting you. You may not see it, you may not understand it, but it's hurting you. Uh, for the people that you know, are students, you need to start building your network. But that doesn't mean just connect to people you don't know. It means connect to people of value, right? Uh, for the professors, you, you know, be careful with your connecting. Um, <laughs> Uh, and then, I, and then, you know, lastly, and I, again, it's, it's just short time. I probably already run over. Sorry. Uh, optimize your usage, right? So, what are you trying to do? Are you looking for a job? 
Are you in sales? What are you, you know, are you recruiting? Um, so, uh, you know, there, there is a use case scenario for you. you. Just don't know what it is. So, you know, you can, uh, we can spend some time together and talk about that. That's it. Um, thank you. Here's my contact information. Don't, don't try to connect me on LinkedIn. I won't connect with you unless I know you. Um, you can follow me on Twitter, but I not, might not follow back. Um, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now I've got, got some time for questions. Oh, it's time for good answers. Anybody want to start? First question. Oh, I know some people brought questions in here, yes. I'll start, uh, Nathan, uh, a very interesting presentation. Um, but I have a technical question. Why does LinkedIn show up very high on Google search? Uh, yes, so um, you know the, the, all the, the big search firms have their algorithms, you know, uh, and their all the big search firms have their algorithms, and they're looking they're looking for fraud, basically, like link building, um, you know, all the all the things you can do to manipulate search results, and because LinkedIn is set up the way that it is, it's very locked locked in its capacity. <coughs> It's rigid. Um, it's just built a lot of credibility over the years. So, um, you know, if you know the Sears debacle where they did the big link building scheme, like that's designed to, to deflect that. And you know, LinkedIn just has a lot of credibility. I mean, it's, it's really just about the algorithms. Good question. Sarah. Uh -oh. I graduated in 2009, so almost two years now. Uh, actually, I can't believe that I sold my wild card on my keys, so uh, it really doesn't feel like it's been that long. But I graduated and I didn't have a job, uh, so like a lot of you, I applied to all those big companies a year ago, thinking that was the right way to go. Uh, didn't work out. I actually applied to a smaller company. It's an engineering firm in Conshohocken, and I got hired to work there for their marketing department. Uh, with me and two other people. We were in the marketing department. I had no engineering background at all, so it was a completely new industry. I worked there for a year, and I, I mean, it was good. It wasn't necessarily the most interesting <coughs> industry, I guess, but I definitely learned a lot about marketing. And um, at this particular company, we were using a software called C-Write, and um, I got to be like one of the more proficient users of it, and I was actually the person that, the person from C-Write, would call and, you know, like I spoke with the rep. So I eventually, through that relationship, found out about the position at C-Write through social media, which was something I was much more interested in, and I applied and leveraged that relationship to get my position now. And um, it's definitely a better fit, and if I had had my choice of the job I could have when I graduated, it definitely would have been this. So I had to take kind of an alternative route to get there, but um, it ended up being the right decision for me. Just, just to say one thing about Stephanie, the first time we met was tonight, today, um, I was really excited about Stephanie being involved on the panel because social and mobile and all of that is a young person's business. Like, if you're over 35, for, no one's over 35 in this. It's all people in their 20s or early 30s. You know, I, there's something wrong with me. I'm in a company with 400 people, young people, no one older than 35, all around the world, Indian, Chinese, UK, Poland, US, et cetera. And it, there's so much opportunity, I, I, I can't even tell you, uh, for coming out of school. But I was excited to, to hear. Yeah, it's, it's very surprising. I mean, you come out of school thinking that uh, everybody's on Facebook and everybody's on LinkedIn. Everybody knows all, knows all the stuff that you've already been using for a couple of years. And no one really did. So that's why the opportunity for me was, uh, I guess, you know, Greg said you have a pretty impressive title for someone two years out, but as far as people who are experienced in this field, they're, it, it didn't matter how old I was, it was knowledge I had using the, the software, so, worked out. That's great. Other questions? We only have a few more minutes, because if there is a reception outside, we have some food, but we do have the room for uh, you know, a while longer to have any more questions. Yes?
Yeah, really good question. The, uh, the um, there are so many apps that are being developed, and uh, there there are certain things that are really smart to do. Um, first and foremost, I would I'd make sure that I ground my concept in the app. In other words, talk to consumers, make sure that the idea that you have is a sound one, so insight driven. The second piece is make sure that you've, you've studied, is there a business model there? Can you make money if that's your objective, right? When you start to look to build it, right, what you want to do is you can build it overseas, you can build it in India, you can build it in the U.S. You know, they can cost $20,000, they can cost seventy five, they can cost 150000 A $20,000 one is a simple app. We built one that's called uh, Vegas Spin the Bottle, and we did it for twenty grand, and that was before I was in the business. But a complex one is about seventy five grand, where it's linked to a database, right? And then 150 would be something like Knocking, the first version of Knocking. Um, it's a little tricky doing it overseas, so what you want to do is if you're working with India, and the Indians are brilliant, right? I'd have a U.S. delivery team. In other words, work with somebody here so you can get the efficiencies of India, right? But working just with India, long distance, a little bit trickier. I want to make sure that there's a company that's traveling U.S. and in, in India. Um, but it, it can take three months, and um, and then make sure that, that if you're going to be launching it in the app stores, that's a whole different thing. There's like a whole way to launch apps that's all about app store, social, and cyber PR. You don't have to go far to launch it, but you do need to have some dollars to launch an app. Does that help? Other questions? Yes. Uh, this is a question for, for Nathan. It's kind of a two-part question. Um, it's about LinkedIn recommendations. How do you go about um, getting someone to write you a LinkedIn recommendation that is verbally agreed or said in an email, I'll write you a recommendation? How many times is it okay to keep hounding them for it? And what if you get a great recommendation from a CEO or a CMO from an organization you worked at, but there was a typo in it uh, <laughs> without you know, embarrassing them or going back to them with you know, some issues? Yeah, um, <clears throat> so uh, w just to, to reverse it, the, the typo thing, you just, you just take it. I mean, if you got a, somebody high level to write your recommendation, they took the time to do it, even, even if you wrote it for them, which is my recommendation on the front end, you know, they did it to get them to take it down or whatever, it's just gonna, it's gonna be more pain than it's worth. And it actually is kind of a cool thing, because then you can talk about it or whatever. Uh, in terms of getting recommendations, um, <laughs> it's just like, Anybody in here that got recommendations to get into Villanova? I mean, you essentially tell somebody, you know, from your network, your parents, friends, I'll write the letter for you, you sign it, like if, if you would approve these things. And that is the easiest way to get recommendations on LinkedIn. Um, you got to make it easy for the person that's doing it. Um, they're not going to put it out there if it's not what they would say. Can, can you, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Did he, uh, you have to find something else to play with. Yeah. I don't think um, so, um, I'm not sure so, I mean, you've got to make it as easy as possible. And, you know, if you're hounding them because you're saying, will you write it? Like, and they don't have, they're like, yeah, it's great. I'd like to write this, but I don't have time. That's different than, like, I don't actually want to write your recommendation. So if they're ignoring you in that capacity, like, I would, like, leave it alone. But if you think it's somebody that really, they really would, but they just don't have the time, I would write it for them, send it to them, ask them, hey, can you post this for me? I, I do it. I still do it. Uh, before I have my question, I do want to just mention, and there are some people here from uh, Dr. Sipir's class. There's uh, somebody here who found uh, Dr. Wood down in front row has a sign up sheet if you want to get credit for attending this session, okay? So see Dr. Wood before you leave. Okay, other questions, right? Other questions? Joel. Yeah, um, this question is for Patrick. I'm interested in knowing if you've uh, if you studied how to control negative. In other words, where somebody's all of a sudden um, ash canning an app or anything marketing wise, right? Um, there are a couple things that we've done. When it, when it comes up, first and foremost, you need to understand the uh, media, but people need to understand the role of Twitter, is to make sure that Twitter's being used either consumer research, research, um, spin, or proactive customer service, right? So, you know, what we do on a lot of things is that when we launch something, there are negatives that are coming up. We're, we're we've got people 24 hours, you know, 24/7 that are seeing those things when they come out. We've got special programs to track those. 
And when they come up, immediately we're on them. And it's, it's amazing that if you're, if you're positive and you're reaching out to somebody, they'll be pretty good about it. Now, they may not like your game, for example, right? But they're not going to be quite as caustic. Um, on it. So we try and proactively go, go after it. It's when it, you let it fester and it becomes a mess. Um, you, you just you, you come out with a human approach, but you've got to be on it. But I was going to say, well, more of a comment than anything else, and it kind of dovetails with Patrick and Nathan in terms of it being episodic. Go back to one of the more famous commercials in the UK, it was this Nescafe commercial. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it built on episode after episode after episode, which kind of dovetails with both of you, what you were saying. The other thing is, Phil Cotton wrote a book called Brand 2.0, mm -hmm. Martin Lindstrom wrote a book called Brand Sense, all talking about how do you build a story into your brand. So now going to Nathan, in terms of LinkedIn, would you recommend, how do you recommend putting your career as episode after episode? In other words, don't have a static profile, especially for students who are going to be adding a lot of experience as they go on, constant, I guess constantly updated. Yeah, um, so and I, if we had more time, I'd do the whole LinkedIn thing, but it's really important that you, you tell your story, right? So if you check out my LinkedIn profile, which is not right or wrong, but I do sort of regimentally tell the story. And I love the word that he's episodic. I've never really heard that. My life is episodic. Um, but people thought it was a problem for a long time. But, um, uh, but you know, I think that you tell your story. And, and you know, another thing about your LinkedIn profile, just for anyone that's looking for a job, even if you have a resume, it doesn't mean put your resume online. Okay? So that, your resume is that, like, that, you know, the, the, the uh, formality. Your, your online presence and your LinkedIn profile is an opportunity to tell the story and tell how you will add value to them. So it's much more uh, storytelling like to say, this is, how, this is what I'm good at, this is what I want to do, this is what I want to learn. Um, and if you put that personality into it, you'll differentiate from all the resume looking LinkedIn profiles, which are like, I crush my numbers 180%. People don't really want to see that, believe it or not. They'll ask you for your resume if they like your, your story. All right, I think you should believe everything that Nathan said today, except the part I did some background checking with some other professors. He's not quite as weak a student as he claimed to have been. The only thing they did say about him was he was a very hard partier. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually that's totally wrong. They're totally wrong. They never party when I was here. Uh, I had, had two babies pop out while I was here. Uh, they're totally wrong. Um, but yeah, that's actually that's true. Uh, and so that's how I got here. Uh, uh, I just had a question. We had a guest speaker from Verizon about three weeks ago, and one of the things in San Francisco, maybe in Silicon Valley, and he was saying one of the hottest things right now is the social recommender mashups that are going on, and if you if you could demo one and have a business plan, you can get class A funding for it. Seeds <coughs> right now, and uh, have you? Uh, this is for the whole panel. And then right after that, Wall Street Journal had a big article on social recommender mashups. So are you hearing anything about this in your world? I mean, I'll, I'll say that, that, that there's a, that, that's not completely true. I mean, there is a lot of money being put into funds to invest, but they're not trigger happy. You know, they're not just, you know, you've got an idea, I'll invest in it. Um, I mean, you've got to have a business plan. You've got to differentiate. I mean, there, there's so many of them. You know, the investors, know, they know that. They're doing the due diligence. So, um, but, there, but, but the innovation side of it, if you can come out with something unique, and so I mean that thing that, I mean I don't even know really specifically what you're talking about in terms of, I mean there's a lot of things like it, but if you can come up with something unique, it's more likely somebody to throw cash at it because they know that, that companies are being acquired left and right. This will be a bubble, I guarantee it for anyone that's like thinking right. financially about it. This will all pop yeah. at some point, but that's investment. It's like know when to get in, you know when to get out. Are you seeing any interesting um, uh, mashups in this area, apps, in the social recommender? What do you mean? Like, what well, like if you go to a website, some apps will show you your friends have been here and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. how many like it. Or you go, if you buy, go look at a catalog, it'll show you how many of your friends bought this. Yeah, that, you know, there's all this. Yeah, like, yeah plus one. Yeah. 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 It's social there, commerce or whatever they're talking yeah, about. Yeah, I guess there, there, there are a couple of things in my in book that I'm writing. One of the things I cover is 
the whole, the whole class of titans between Google and also versus Facebook. And you're going to spend a lot of time with Facebook guys in terms of the, the like button and what it gets to you, gets you and where it's going. And uh, now the ability to target in on individual people based on, well, he likes Heineken, he likes this, he likes this kind of car, right? The ability to target in and also leverage that information with your friends is the next version that's coming from Facebook, right? And like, Google's running quickly, because when you think about it, you know, do you want to know what your friends think? Oh, how is this movie? I type it in, boom, my hundred friends say, hey, we like it, we hate it. Or do you want to go out to a whole bunch of people that you don't know? So there's a big battle that's come up on the whole life versus, uh, you know, recent, you know, you can see Google's trying to upgrade with many different things coming quick. Uh, on the piece on VCs, you know, I'm on a board of uh, a couple boards that are kind of emerging tech, like Nokia. But at SourceBits, we've got, we've done over 300 apps, we've got 65 projects on at a time. It's amazing what we see coming through our portal in the US and in India. Everything from alternative lifestyle, um, Wi-Fi, and, and other interactive, in a bar, club kind of setting interactions, all the way over to things that are going on in uh, enterprise, and everything in between. There are things that are coming that are a year or two out, but blow your mind. Now, on the VC piece and the investment, uh, it's really rigorous. I'm not going we met with 80 VCs last year. I think we wanted to kill ourselves. Right? <laughs> One of them said to us, we'll give you, we'll give you $5 million for 90% equity. Right? Which is insulting. Right? Well, it so happens that we were successful having 3 million apps, but we had to monetize. We're getting set to monetize now. Now everybody wants in. And we're finally going to other sources of funding. But it's tricky getting the investment. Is that customer first? Mon yeah, monetize. We have three million. We didn't have to monetize. We did not have that. Any other questions? There's no questions. I'd like to thank, again, thank uh, our panel for being here.